All righty. Hello, everyone. Hello. All right. I'm glad you guys are here tonight. <laughs> I know the weather's kind of crazy out there right now with all that rain, but yes, amen. I'm glad that we're here. Hey, because I, I like what you said, Vicky, when he came in. God don't take no breaks just because it's raining, right? God still moves even though it's raining, amen? Hey, I always say we can go everywhere else, right? We can go to we can go out to eat, we can go to work, we can go all these other places when it rains, so why not church, amen? I'm already stepping on some toes, amen? <laughs> amen. Hey, the weather, the weather is not looking too nice outside here in Texas, but uh, here in Ocampo, I should say. But uh, hey, we have to take the good, we have to take the bad with the good, you know? So we got good days and we got bad days, and it's like that in life, amen? We just got to take the bad days too. God is still on the throne. He's still ready to do something. He's still ready to move, so let's praise him today, amen? amen. I like uh, the book of Psalms. Uh, oh, I, had to, I had the chapter written down earlier. I, for, I forgot, but the book of Psalms says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, amen? So even today belongs to the Lord. There's another scripture that says that, this day belongs to the Lord. Let's celebrate. Let's let's celebrate his goodness today. Amen. So every day is a good day as long as it's above ground. That's what my dad always said. Amen. <laughs> long as it's above ground, every day is a good day. Amen. Amen. So uh, I want y'all just to continue to be praying, you know, of course, for all the needs we have in the church. And uh, pr uh, praise God, I got an interview next week for a job. Amen. Amen. <laughs> An online, it's an online teaching job. Amen. Another online teaching job. Amen. It's a pretty cool company. Um, they, uh, I guess like there's some schools in the nation that they don't have physical teachers. They just have like a screen and a teacher will come up and present like a slideshow to them and teach them a lesson. I guess there's some schools that do it like that. And uh, they needed some teachers for that. So I can do that from, I can be teaching somebody from the comfort of my own home, you know. <laughs> It's cool. And so I'm teaching like a group of kids. So, hey, if it all goes good, uh, you never know what God can do. Amen. So I'm leaving all my options open and I'm just I'm glad that, uh, you know, it's something. It's better than nothing. Amen. So and, uh, I know that uh, you guys have been praying for me to, you know, be blessed in that area of finances and, and my job and things like that. So thank you for praying for your pastor. I appreciate it. Amen. Because it's working. Amen. I can feel it. Yeah. Anyways, I felt like there was something I was going to uh, I was going to say, oh, you know, um, I actually, when we were driving here, I just, I felt kind of prompted just to, just, just to share a little something with you guys that y'all already know. Uh, but I just, I feel like, you know, when I was driving here, I, I just felt, you know, I was telling Albert today that my mind has just kind of been all over the place lately, you know, just trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do with my finances? You know, all the, all the needs that are in the church and, you know, I've kind of just been scatterbrained. Anybody ever felt scatterbrained before? Like where you got so much, you know, there's so many things that you can worry about and things that are trying to steal your joy. And it can be hard sometimes to stay, you know, the Bible tells us, right, to be narrow-minded, you know, be focused on that one thing, be focused on Christ and everything else will fall into place, right? But when there's all these things that are happening in your life, they're trying to pull you a bunch of different directions. It's kind of hard to stay single-minded sometimes. And, uh, I've kind of been like that lately, you know, but hey, I, I thank God I've been spending time with him and, and seeking his face. And, you know, on the way up here, I felt like God was just showing me, you know, how, how blessed I really am. You know, I, I really am blessed. And I, I'm saying this, not just me. I think that we need to take an inventory of our life and just see how blessed we really are today. You know, it's so easy in our nature to focus on the bad. Why do we always do that? We focus on the bad things. We focus on our flaws, the, the, just the bad, the negative, even the news. You turn on the news, you don't see good news, right? You see bad news. All the airplanes that fell out of the sky today, but they don't ever tell you about the thousands that stayed in the sky, right? But we're, we're, so, we're so tempted to focus on those things. But if we can just focus on our blessings and what we do have, I think we'll be a lot happier. You know, hey, I got a roof over my head. I got food in my fridge. Amen. I got clothes on my back. I got an interview coming up. I'm still working. Uh, what are you thankful for today? What are, what, what are you blessed with today? You know, look, start looking at your blessings and just seeing what you have. Some of you are walking around with a brand new iPhone in your pocket. You're blessed. Let me put it like that. I still got the iPhone. I don't know. I think this is an 8 or something. I don't know. <laughs> I got a dinosaur phone. I'm looking to upgrade. Amen. 
But uh, hey, we're blessed. We're blessed to be here. Amen. I just, I felt like, I felt led just to share that with y'all today. I just want y'all to be mindful of y'all's blessings. Okay, be mindful of what God is doing in your life today. Amen. So I just wanted to share that with y'all. So anyways, we'll go ahead and, and we'll get started. Uh, so y'all know the first Wednesday of every month, we try to have a special service. Amen. And it is the first Wednesday of the month. Can y'all believe the, the year is almost over? Amen. Two more months. And then it'll be over. I, I don't know where the time went. But, uh, yeah, it's the first of the month. So what I wanted to do today uh, for a special service, Pastor Larry actually gave me this idea. Uh, we'll try something a little different next month. But this month, what I wanted to do was I wanted to take a chapter out of my book and kind of just walk you all through it. All right. Okay? We're going to do that. So, And, yeah, this is a topic, honestly, that we've talked about before. Uh, but I know that there's a lot of people in here that I'm, I'm pretty sure were not here when I talked about it. Probably more than half of you were not here when I talked about it. So it's good that we're going to talk about it today. And it's something very important that y'all need to know about, okay? And it's Daniel's prophecy. Have anybody ever heard of that before, Daniel's prophecy? No. It's, it's very important for you to know because I'm going to say something very bold to you today, Okay. I believe that Daniel's prophecy is the most important prophecy in the Bible. The most important. And y'all know that there's tons of prophecies in the Bible, right? There's hundreds, maybe thousands of prophecies in the Bible. And your pastor's telling you that Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 is the most important. And we're going to find out why today. So it's very important for you to know. Amen? Now, uh, you know, speaking of... uh, I was talking about bad news earlier, right? Uh, I've shared this with y'all before, but there's a Facebook page that I follow. It's called End Time Headlines. And uh, the, the, the man that runs that page has hundreds of thousands of, hundreds of thousands of followers on that page. So it's a very popular page. And he makes a lot of money on that page too. Because the way it works is he'll post a link about anything bad that's going on in the world and says that it's a sign of the end. Because uh, have y'all heard stuff like that before? Like everything is a sign uh, of the end of the world, okay? And uh, Daniel, it, Daniel's prophecy is, has to do a little bit with that, so I'm going somewhere with this. But everything is a sign. Y'all remember the blood moons? They were a sign of the end, but now we ain't even talking about those anymore. So what happened to that? Uh, when bad things happen, earthquakes happen in other countries, it's a sign of the end. Uh, when a plane falls out of the sky, it's a sign of the end. How many of y'all remember, I think it was two years ago when Kobe Bryant passed away? Remember, wasn't it like two years ago, I think? Well, people were saying that that was a sign of the end as well because his name, they, they were taking his name and translating into in some kind of hidden message saying that God was, he's, is, he's the gate or something like that. God is coming. So the death of Kobe Bryant is a sign that Jesus Christ is fixing to come back any time. So does anybody out there besides me think that's ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> that that's kind of silly, right, to, to be thinking stuff like that? Well, this man, anytime he finds something bad that happens on the news, which it's not hard to find, anywhere, everywhere you look, there's, there's bad news. Okay, Not to be a rain cloud, but it's true, right? There's bad things that happen all around us. And so what he'll do is he'll post a link on his Facebook page that takes you to his page where he writes a little bit about it. And then on that page, he has tons of advertisements on there. So about anything and everything, shavers and schools, just random stuff, advertisements. And that's how he makes his money because those companies pay him to put their advertisements on his page. Do you you understand that? And so he makes probably over $10,000 a month just doing that by spreading lies and bad news, in my opinion, because I don't think that those things are a sign of the end. And it's biblically not true, right? So I'm saying that just to tell you, just to keep your mind open and to keep your eyes open when it comes to stuff like that. And if you understand the prophecy of Daniel, then you'll understand a lot about the end times. Again, it's the most important prophecy. So you cannot fully understand the end times unless you understand Daniel's prophecy. Okay, I'm going to say that again. 
You cannot fully understand the end times unless you understand Daniel's prophecy, which is in chapter 9. Y'all can flip there now if y'all want. And we're just going to kind of walk through it, and I'm going to tell you what it means, okay? That's all we're going to do tonight. Because a lot of people kind of find it hard to understand. But if you read it carefully and you just kind of slow down, I think that you can, you can understand what it means. So I got my book printed out up here, so I'm just going to walk through that. So if you got your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 9, and uh, we'll start at verse 24. Pastor Larry, I'm just going to read it from the screen, okay, since I got all these papers up here. That'll probably be easier for me. Daniel chapter 9. Now, just to give you a background of Daniel real quick, how many of you know that the Israelites in the Old Testament, they had a kingdom, and they had, uh, you know, citizens. It was a big nation, and then they disobeyed God. They sinned against God, and so God sent the Babylonians to the Israelites, and they took them into slavery into Babylon. God allowed that to happen because of their sin. And so now they're all slaves. Most of them are slaves in Babylon, and that's when Daniel was written. Daniel was a slave in Babylon, just to give you a background. And there was a prophecy that went forth from Jeremiah that said that the Israelites were going to be in slavery for 70 years. And Daniel's chilling there in exile, in slavery, and he begins to, you know, he's studying the scriptures, and he looks at the dates, Mary, and he says, it's almost 70 years already. We should be getting out of here pretty soon because that's what the prophecy said. And he starts thinking about it, and that's, that's what happens at the beginning of chapter 9. And then an angel comes to him, and an angel gives him a prophecy to kind of tell him what's going to happen next. Okay, It's pretty interesting stuff. And then we'll, we'll start at verse uh, 24. All righty. Okay, y'all just follow me, okay? You might not understand it at first, but I'll explain it to you. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And let me stop right there so I can break it down for you, okay? 70 weeks. Does anybody know what that means? 70 weeks. Okay, this prophecy is actually years. The weeks represent years there, seven sets of years. Let me say it like that. So how many days are there in a week? Seven. Seven days. And so every scholar agrees that that word week right there, actually in the Hebrew, it just means like a seven. Like a seven. You know, like there's like in a, you go to the store and you buy eggs, you buy a dozen eggs, right? Well, this a week is a seven. And so what it represents is years. So he says, basically what it's saying is 70 sets of seven years. Okay? Do you all understand that? Yes. 70 sets of seven years. It's like math, right? I hate math, but that's what it is. 70 sets of seven years. So if you think of like uh, 70 dozens would be, I don't know how much that is, 70 times 12. But just think of 70 sevens, 70 times 7, which is 490 years. Hector got his calculator out back there, <laughs> his phone calculator. So it's actually 490 years. Pretty much every scholar agrees with that, Mary. So I know it's kind of a weird word, and it's hard to kind of like, what is that? But every scholar thinks and believes, and it's true, that 70 weeks there is 490 years, okay? So you can just kind of substitute that part, take out 70 weeks, and just say 490 years. 490 years are determined for your people and for your holy city. Okay, so he's basically saying there's 490 years until something's going to happen. That's a weird number. I don't know why God chose that number, but I must, well, we're going we're gonna to dig more into it. So are y'all with me so far? Amen. Okay, all right. Not too hard to understand right now. And then he says right here, the 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to do what? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint 
the most holy, okay? Pretty powerful things right there. A lot of scholars, they call those like the six things there. And so what do y'all think that means, like to finish the transgression, make an end of sins? To, what do you think? When did that happen? What do y'all think? Does anybody want to? When Jesus came. Amen, Mary. Okay, when Jesus came. Well, specifically what I believe is that that happened when Jesus died, right? When he died on the cross, if you want to be more specific about it. Because when Jesus died, what happened? He, 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 took he, he took all our sins. He made an end to, he finished the transgression. He brought in everlasting righteousness, right? When Jesus died, that's what his blood did. It provided a righteousness for us. And then also it sealed up the vision and prophecy. Well, what does that mean? That just means that like the whole Old Testament points to Jesus, and so all the prophecies, all the pictures in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, all that stuff pointed to Jesus. So what it's saying right there is whenever uh, to seal up vision and prophecy, when Jesus came and when he died and when he did what he came here to do, all prophecies were fulfilled in that. When Jesus died, and because that was prophesied in the Old Testament, he, he fulfilled. That's why we believe he's God in the flesh. That's why we believe that he's the Messiah, because he fulfilled all the prophecies. Did y'all know that uh, the Jewish people, for example, today, don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah? You know, if, he's sitting, if you sit next to a Jew on the plane, they'll tell you something like, well, when Messiah gets here, he's going to fix all things. And what you'll tell that person is the Messiah already came, right? Because we believe that he's Jesus. And they'll tell you, well, why do you say that? Because he fulfilled all the prophecies in the Old Testament. That's why we, we believe that Jesus was the Messiah, because all those things that were prophesied in the Old Testament about bringing in a new covenant, shedding the blood for the remission of sins, all happened with Jesus' death on the cross. I believe that. I don't know about y'all. Amen? But all these things are going to happen. And then to anoint the most holy. What does that mean? That means that Jesus would be anointed, basically. He would be anointed to start his ministry when he came. So let's slow down. Let's back up just a bit. He says, and a period of 490 years, all this stuff is going to happen, and Jesus is going to show up, and he's going to be anointed as the most holy one to accomplish everything he's supposed to accomplish. Okay, so are y'all following me so far? Yes. Okay. Amen. And that's actually important to know because there's actually... Like futurist, you know, a futurist is somebody who believes that uh, in the future, the great tribulation, the rapture, and all that stuff is going to happen. And there are some futurists, probably most, who believe that some or not all of these things have happened yet. Because if all these things have happened already, then there's nothing that's going to happen in the future, they say. And they'll say things like, well, look around. There's, there's people that still sin, so how can you say that there's an end to sins? Well, how would y'all respond to that? Because there's people that still sin out there, right? Well, it depends on how you look at that part right there. Because to me, when I read to make an end of sins, I don't think that's saying that nobody's ever going to sin again, and there's not going to be any sin in the world. That means that Jesus brought an end to general sin in, in general, the power of sin in people's lives, right? He brought an end to the sin he, he defeated the sin issue. I can say it like that. There are people that still do acts of sin, but now your sin has been defeated. So if you don't know that, you should believe that today, that, that Jesus went to the cross for your sin issue. Okay, so the, the acts of sin that you do don't make you a sinner. Why? Because Jesus defeated sin. He brought an end to sins. But of course, doing acts of sin is still not good, right? Because it there's consequences for doing that. Amen? But Jesus brought an end to sin. He made an end to sin. He sacrificed himself one time on the cross, and that sacrifice removed the sin. Amen? Okay, so we're, I think we're headed in a good place so far. Amen? So now let's just jump to the next verse. We're going to take this really slow, okay? And I also wanted to say, if y'all have any questions, just raise your hand, okay? It's a special Wednesday night, so we can dialogue if y'all want to. We can do that any Wednesday night or any day, so, but uh, feel free to ask questions if you have any, okay? So let's just keep moving. Verse 25. And then he says, yes, 490 years. 
And then verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, now we're getting a little, what's going on here now, right? Okay, y'all stay with me, okay? Don't check out yet. Don't start falling asleep. <laughs> okay, so he says, let's take it slow. That from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, I think, Pastor Larry, you've taught us that message about Nehemiah and Ezra before. Remember, like I said at the beginning, they were taken into slavery. Then 70 years later, they went back to Jerusalem and they rebuilt it. So picture two points. There's one here, one here. From the going forth to rebuild Jerusalem, in other words, when the king was going to let them go back to rebuild their land until Messiah the Prince, who is Jesus, there's going to be this amount of time, okay? So from the time they went back to Jerusalem to rebuild until Jesus comes, okay, there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Let's do the math together. I'm not, who, who, who in here is good at math? I'm not. <laughs> he's good back there. He said he's good. I'm not good. Do you know what uh, seven times seven is? No, oh, I said, got to learn the multiplication tables. All right, y'all good, 49. That's just like ingrained in your head, right? 49. Yeah. Do you know what 62 times seven is? 444. Four, four, close, 434. 434. So it's just multiplication math. So we have 49 plus 434, and that equals 489. So I know y'all are like, I didn't come to a math class tonight. I can't. <laughs> but this prophecy has some math in it, does it not? So you have to know it. It's just basic math, just multiplication. I hate math. I'm not good at math, but I'm better at English. But seven weeks and 62 weeks, that just means 483 years. So he says, from the time that they would go back to Jerusalem to rebuild until Jesus showed up on the scene, there would be 483 years. Okay, that, that, y'all understand that? That partially fulfills the 70 weeks, Yes, yeah, that partially fulfills. Okay, so how many years altogether are there in the 70 weeks? Altogether? 490. 490. But right here he's saying that until this there would be 483 years which leaves seven years left, right? Which I'm going to tell y'all what the seven years are, okay? Mary's already got it. <laughs> I'm going to tell y'all what the seven years are soon. So don't get ahead of me, Pastor Larry. <laughs> no, that's good that you brought that out. <laughs> so right now we're just sitting at 483 years, and that leaves seven years left, okay? Yes, yes, okay. So let's figure it out, okay? Are y'all still with me? Okay, let's figure it out. And then he said, where did I leave off? Okay, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Well, when did that happen? That happened with Ezra and, and Nehemiah, like what Pastor Larry taught us. When they went back to rebuild, they had a lot of trouble rebuilding, right? Those people tried to come and stop them from rebuilding. There was a lot of bad things that happened that tried to keep them from rebuilding. And actually, even after they were built, they still got conquered again and again by different nations, the Greeks and stuff like that. It was the Persians, then it was the Medes, then I believe the Greeks. You all heard of Alexander the Great? He was one that conquered them as well. And then it was uh, the Romans. That's why when we get to Jesus, they're under the Roman rule. Because they were, they were constantly being conquered because they were still in sin. And so, uh, so he said it's going to be built again, the wall, even in troublesome times. Okay, I think we can move on from there. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, cool. That means I'm doing good. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. But it went forth. Uh, let me give you the, I can give you the year that it happened. Uh, let me see if I can find it here on my sheets. Amen. 458 BC. 458 BC was when they went back to rebuild. And y'all know, before Christ showed up on the scene, the years 
you got to count them backwards, right? It's 458, 457, four, and then all the way to zero, right, when Jesus comes, and then you start counting up. One, two, three. So in 458 B.C. was when it started, when they went back. Now, if you do some math here, 458 B.C., and you add the 483 years to that, I don't, I don't does any, anybody want to try? 458 B.C. add the 483 years that we're talking about, what year do we come to? You got to go the other way, other way. So remember, you go backwards from 458 B.C. So kind of like subtracting. Subtract 458 minus 483. I see everybody working, so I don't want to jump. 25? Okay, good. So like it's around 25 or around 26 A.D., around that area. 25, 26 A.D., what happened in the year 26 A.D.? Jesus started his ministry just like the scripture says, 483 years until Jesus the Messiah, till Messiah the Prince. So you see how the math fits exactly? The angel is giving him the exact amount of time as to when Jesus was going to show up and start his ministry. So if you, again, let me slow down. You start at 458 BC because that's when they went back to rebuild. And then you just add what he says right here, the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, which is 483. You really, you subtract, because again, you got to go the, the other way. And so you subtract, and it brings you all the way to 20, around 25, 26 AD. I think you have to account like for the zero or something like that. And it comes to like 26 AD, which is when Jesus began his ministry. Okay? So the last, that, now I'm probably going to jump ahead a little bit here. So the last seven years was actually Jesus' ministry when he was here on the earth. Okay, y'all are probably thinking ahead, but let's slow down, okay? So that's, that's the significance. That's why he's giving them, that's why he's giving him these weeks and these years right here, because he wants Daniel to know the exact time of when Jesus would show up and, and do all those things that he said he was going to do. All right? Amen. So can we move on? Everybody got it? Okay, let's go to verse 26. If y'all have questions, just stop me. And then he says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Meaning everyone agrees that that means he's going to be killed, which he was, right? Yeah. But not for himself. And then it says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. I know maybe y'all's minds are probably going a bunch of different directions right here. But right after that part where it says Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself, that's where futurism and what we believe, how the, all this stuff happened in the past, that's where everybody parts ways right there. Because what futurism actually says is the prince right there, they, they believe that that's the Antichrist. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, y'all are like, what? Yes, that's what they believe. They believe that at the end of those 483 years, God inserted a gap of time in there. In other words, what God did was he stopped the clock. If you ever had a clock and you stopped it somewhere or something like that, you, you stopped it. They believe that when Jesus died, they stopped that clock. God stopped that clock. And then now we are now in a gap or a church age, they say. And then whenever this age ends is when Jesus comes back for the second coming and he raptures the church off the planet. And during those last seven years that are now thrown into the future, those last seven years are where they get the seven-year great tribulation. So if you've ever, have, have, have you ever heard that they say that when the rapture happens, there's going to be a seven-year period of time on the earth where there's a great tribulation? Well, have you ever wondered, like, where did they get seven years from? Where, how did they come up? That's it. They get it from Daniel's 70th week. They believe... That part right there, 
Well, what we believe about that part is that that's talking about the Jewish and Roman war whenever they came to destroy the temple in 70 AD. But what they say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying there. Yeah, about the flood. But what they believe is that this, when it's, again, I want you, those first two lines right there, those first two right there, they believe that there's a 2,000-year gap right here. Wow. So all this is in the future, but these first two are in, in the past when Jesus came. So they have to interpret where it begins and the people of the prince who is to come, they have to interpret it a different way. So they say that what that means is that the Antichrist is going to come up, and he's going to destroy the temple. But there ain't no temple right now, right? That's where they come up with the idea that there's going to be a rebuilt temple, because there has to be a rebuilt temple to them in order to fulfill the scripture. So the Bible doesn't specifically say that there's going to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, right? But if you interpret it the way they're interpreting it, then there has to be a temple in the future for the Antichrist to destroy. Do you all understand what I'm saying? That's where all that doctrine comes from, about a rebuilt temple. Have you ever heard that, like, they're going to sacrifice a red heifer and all that in the future? I don't know if you all have heard that. But uh, they believe that during those seven years, what's going to happen, once we get raptured, this is what they believe, once we get raptured off the earth, God is going to go back to dealing with the Jewish people for those last seven years. So, in other words, animal sacrifices are going to be accepted again. They're going to go back under law. Wow. <laughs> To me, that's kind of blasphemy, right? Because the blood of Jesus, what was the purpose of Jesus coming? He sacrificed his body. But if, if you think like a futurist, then, then all this has to be going back to the law and animal sacrifices. And then after that seven years, that's when Christ rules on the earth for a thousand years. And then we live in heaven forever with Jesus. The church does. Yeah. Right. So if people, so if we're all raptured, the Christians are raptured, and God is turning back for the Jews, then I want y'all to think about this. Basically, in a nutshell, God is getting the church out of here so he can go back and deal with the Jews. In other words, the rapture is not really a celebration. It's really, let me get you out of the way because I need to get back to my people. Mm hmm. That's right, which is crazy, right? <laughs> it's crazy to think about, but the reason why people cling so much to futurism is because they don't know that part. All, all they know, you think about it, most people, most people, let's just say in our vicinity, they know about the rapture, right? Yeah. But they don't know about this, right. where, where God is going to go back to the Jewish people and animal sacrifices. If you really study the doctrine out, that's what it's teaching, and that's what's going to happen. According to them, I don't believe that's true. I believe that's nonsense, but they—that's why they cling so heavily to it, and that's why we teach y'all to study y'all's Bible. Because if you know the truth, the truth will set you free, right? So, you, but they believe that, but they don't know that part of it. But you—you you have to know it. It's like, uh, for example, the Mormons, right? The Mormons come to your door and they knock on your door, right? Anybody ever had a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or something like that? They come to your door and they knock, right? And they, they tell you about Jesus, right? And they, Mormons say that Jesus is awesome and all that. But what they don't tell you when they first visit you is they believe that Jesus is the brother of Satan. They don't tell you stuff like that. They don't tell you stuff like that you can get baptized for somebody who already de who's already dead and get them saved again. They believe that stuff. But they don't tell you that. Why not? Because you're going to slam the door in their face, right? <laughs> It's the same thing with this futurist stuff. If, if you really know the truth, you'd be like, man, this is crazy to believe that, you know? That's why you have to study it out a little bit more. And all that stuff I said is true. I got a book about it this thick. 
okay, about the Mormons and stuff like that. So, but I'm just telling you, if you really study it out, that's what they believe, okay? According to them, I don't know if I should say this, but uh, 50 years ago, black people couldn't even be saved as a Mormon. So that's Mormonism, okay? Got quiet when I said that, but they believe that, okay? Well, we don't look at that stuff. We don't know that stuff. But according to them, that's what they teach. But we know that that's not true, right? Yeah. That's ridiculous. Okay, so anyways, he says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. They say that the prince there is the Antichrist. Who do y'all think the prince is? That's a good question, right? Well, go, can you go back one verse, Pastor Larry? Go to 25. Uh, no, no, but good guess. What does it say in verse 25? Messiah the prince. And so why would it be taught, why would it mention a prince here as Jesus and then just in the next verse a prince is now the antichrist? What just a natural flow of thought it would be like okay verse 25 says Messiah the prince and then verse uh, 26 it says the prince who is to come who is Jesus. That's Jesus right there. The prince who is to come who's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary is Jesus. Now, you're like, what? Remember, destroy the city and the sanctuary. What was that? That was the temple being destroyed, okay? Now, there's some people that disagree with that, but God was the one who allowed that to happen because the law had to be destroyed. The temple had to be destroyed, and that's why he warned everybody in the New Testament, repent, believe the gospel, because if you don't, and you cling to Judaism, and you cling to the temple, in a few years, the temple's going to be destroyed, and you're going to be killed when the Romans come and invade it. And God, God was the one who, who allowed, I should say, or used the Roman army to come and destroy the temple and to get rid of the old covenant so that we can be fully under the new covenant. Okay. Now, I know some of y'all still have questions, but I kind of went a little ahead of myself. It's going to be clear as I read a few more verses here, Okay. But for now, just uh, th what I really wanted you to pay attention to here is the prince, okay? Because, again, they totally, it, it's totally wild to think that the prince of the previous verse is now an entirely different prince over here. Natural flow of thought would just make you think that this prince right here is the same prince that it was talking about in just the previous verse, right? Which would be Jesus, Messiah the prince. So the people of the prince who is to come, the prince there is Jesus. Yeah. And the city that's going to be destroyed and the flood and the war and all that, all that's talking about 70 A.D., which is why y'all need to learn that stuff. 70 A.D. is very important because it's in this prophecy right alongside the prophecy about Jesus coming and dying for your sins. That shows me that 70 A.D. was a significant event that more people need to know about. If the temple wasn't destroyed, who knows what we would be today? But 70 A.D. happened, and the temple was destroyed, and the old covenant was taken out of the way completely, and now we're under the new covenant. Yes. We're new covenant believers. The Bible says you're a, new, you're a minister of the new covenant. Amen. Amen. So do y'all believe that? Amen. Okay. All right. So where are we now? My screen just turned off. 27. Number 27. Amen. Yeah, we can go. Okay. Can we move on from that? Yes. Okay. Let's go to verse 20. Actually... Okay, uh, what, I think I have Matthew next, right, Pastor Larry? Now, now kind of keep your finger there or put your ribbon in there and jump to Matthew chapter 22. Because I had told you guys that the prince, the people of the prince who was to come was Jesus and <laughs> the Roman army that came to destroy the temple, right? I'm going to prove it to you. In Matthew chapter 22, verse, we'll just read verse 1. We'll start there. So you have the people of the prince who is to come. I believe that the prince was Jesus. And I believe that the people there, the people of the prince, is the Roman army that came to destroy. The Roman army is what God used as his instrument to destroy the temple. Okay, let me, let me prove that to you. Verse, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Go ahead, Pastor Larry. Okay, it says... And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables. And he said, the kingdom of heaven 
is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. So he invited a lot of people to come to his son's wedding, and nobody came. That's sad, right? Like when he ain't got nobody coming to church. That's sad, right? No, nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not really. But anyways, it says in verse 4, again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited. See? Go ahead, Pastor Larry. Sorry. I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. So again, they ain't coming to that wedding. And the rest seized the servants. Look at that part. Treated them spitefully and killed them. Wow. Okay, so the king sent servants to go tell everybody to come. And what did they do to those servants? Killed them. And what does it say? But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And look what it says. And what did he do? And he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers, and he burned up their city. Now, what do y'all think this is a parable about? About 70 AD, right? Jesus, is, he's talking to the Jews here, and he says that this is what the kingdom is like. You know, the kingdom of God is like, I'm inviting you to the gospel. I'm inviting you to the new covenant. But all these Jewish people, they didn't believe, right? They didn't believe in the new covenant. They didn't receive Jesus. They killed Jesus, and they killed the prophets, Matthew 23 says. All the prophets that came saying there's going to be a new covenant. you got to believe in Jesus when he gets here. All the Jewish people took those prophets and killed them, beat them, treated them. If you, do, if, if you don't believe me, read Jeremiah. They beat Jeremiah, the prophet. They beat Daniel. They, they beat these prophets. And then what did, what did the king say in the story? He said, I'm going to send my armies to destroy the city. And again, he's saying, this is like the gospel. I'm, I'm using this parable to tell you that this is like the gospel. I'm inviting you Jewish people into my system, into the new covenant. You're refusing. So what am I going to do as God? I'm going to send my armies. Notice he says he sent his armies. So the Romans were God's army his instrument that he used to destroy those murderers and burn up their city. Now, again, there are, there's some people out there that don't believe that, but because people don't want to, they don't want to think that God would do something like that. Uh, for example, I've heard of some people that say that. But in the Old Testament, God used armies, heathen armies like the Egyptians, to go and to, he used the Babylonians to go and take the Israelites and put them into slavery. And some of them died. Some of them were killed. God did that because they were not, they didn't believe because they were living in sin. It's the same thing here with this Jewish system here. They were still living by the old covenant. They were still sacrificing animals. In Paul's day and Peter's day and Jesus' day, the Jews didn't believe in Jesus. They, they killed the apostles. They killed the disciples. Every one of them died except John. And so God said, I'm sending my armies to, the, is to, to Jerusalem to destroy that city. And unless you believe, then you're going to burn and you're going to die with the city. When the city goes down, think about it. Millions, history says that, about, that around a million Jewish people died whenever the temple fell. It was, it was a very horrific event. There's a whole book about all the events that happened there, and some of them are very sad and very gory of what happened to the Israelite people. And so this all happened, though, because they didn't believe. If they had believed in Jesus, when Jesus told them in Matthew 24, when you see the Roman armies coming, flee. He said that in Matthew 24, right? When you see these armies, flee. If you believe in me, flee. So the people that believed in Jesus, when it came, they fled. History tells us this. But the people that stayed didn't believe in Jesus fell when the city fell as well. So a lot of the Jewish people died there. So why did I tell you that? To show you that in Daniel's prophecy in 926, I think it was, he's the people of the prince who was to come was Jesus and the Roman army that came. Do y'all understand? Do y'all follow that? Yeah. Okay. Again, futurists say that it's the Antichrist and a future army. Some people say it's the Russians 
coming to destroy Jerusalem any day now. And it's uh, other nations. Some people say it's China or whatever. So uh, hey, you gotta, you gotta, if you know that stuff, you can see how crazy it can get. But none of that matters. We can sit here and speculate all day. If it's, is it the Russians? Is it the Chinese? None of that matters if all this happened in the past. <laughs> That's the way I see it, right? <laughs> Why am I going to speculate about the Russians coming to destroy Israel any day now if all this isn't even talking about the future? This happened in the past with 70 AD. See, it's two different, entirely different beliefs, right? And I want y'all to believe the right thing. Amen? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, go back to, now jump back to Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 20. Yes, we'll start at verse 27. Actually, uh, we'll, we'll start at verse 26 again. Just something real quick I want to point out about that. Daniel 9, 26, Pastor Larry. Almost finished. Are y'all understanding so far? Yeah. Okay. When you kind of slow down and just read it verse by verse, it's kind of, you can kind of understand it a little bit more, right? And he says, the end, the end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. So in other words, what happened was when Jesus was killed, Jesus was killed in the, in the last part of those seven years, right? That's when he was killed. When Jesus was killed, God said, okay, that's enough. Now the desolations are determined. Now all y'all are going to burn because y'all killed my son. But it didn't happen right away, right? God gave them a 40-year time to repent because 30 to 70 AD, Jesus died around 30, right? Around 30 to 70 AD, there's 40 years, which is why in Matthew 24, it says, this generation shall not pass until all these things have happened. A generation is 40 years. And so God was basically what God is saying is that when you kill my son, the desolations are determined right there. I ba basically, I'm, I'm, stamping, I'm stamping the paper. I'm giving the go. The, old, the temple's going to be destroyed. The city's going to be burned. Anybody who clings to it is going to die. He stamped it right there when Jesus died. But he gave them 40 years to believe the gospel and to repent. Because he didn't want anybody to perish, as it says. That's why when you read the New Testament, you see a bunch of scriptures that say, believe the gospel, repent, turn. God's not willing that anyone should perish. All this is going to burn. Be ready for when Jesus comes back, because God was giving them time to repent. And then 40 years later, exactly 40 years later, the temple fell, and they were destroyed. Okay? I know I'm kind of saying a mouthful, but I just wanted you to understand that last part. And then verse 27. And so far, I want y'all also just to be aware that we haven't read anything about a gap in time yet, have we? We haven't read anything about God stopping the time clock. We haven't read anything about there being 2,000 years between Daniel's 69th week and the 70th week, but they believe that stuff, and it's not even there, right? They just assume all this stuff that there's a big old gap of time there, but it's not true. The Bible doesn't say anything about a hidden gap of time. Let me ask y'all something. What comes right after 69? 70. <laughs> so, <laughs> a gap, exactly. Well, let, me, let me put it to you like this. If I told you that you were going to be in, let's say I told Hector, Hector, you're going to jail for 70 years. That's almost a life sentence, right? I told you you were going to jail for 70 years. And then the 70 years comes, and then 71 comes, and you're still in jail. And then let's say 2,000 years pass, 2,070 years later, you're still in jail. And then let's say you get out of jail, you're going to come to me, and what are you going to say? You told me I was going to be in jail for 70 years. Why was I in jail for 2,070 years? How would he respond if I told him, no, you were in jail for 70 years, but I inserted a secret gap of time in between the 69th year and the 70th year? And I didn't count those years because I was doing something else during that time. But technically, you still were 70 years, according to my clock. <laughs> How would you respond to that? How would anybody respond to that? Nonsense, right? It's 70. You told me 70 years. Okay, but to a futurist, it's not nonsense. That's why people need to understand what they believe. Because if you understand it, you'll see that it's nonsense, right? 70 comes after, at, on December 31st. 2021, 
what's going to happen the next day? We're going to get into 2022. There's not going to be a gap of time, right? And it's going to be 2021 for 3,000 more years, right? 2022 comes. Okay, so just the natural, if you just think about it with common sense and just logic, you'll see that if, Dan, if Daniel says that there's going to be 490 years, there's going to be 490 consecutive years that happen one right after the other. Okay, but not to a futurist. At the end of that, at the end of that 480, 30 year, 2,000 years, we're still going right now. So in other words, they believe that we're still in that gap of time right now because Jesus hasn't come back yet. The seven-year Great Tribulation hasn't started yet. That's why they call it, if you've ever heard it, the church age, the gap, the church gap, the parentheses. We're in that gap of time. And then when Jesus comes back for his second coming, what happens? The seven-year Great Tribulation. God starts that clock again, and the seven years start from there. Are y'all see where it comes from now? It's weird, right? But that's what they believe. Okay? Very weird. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I just, you know, like it just common sense tells you that he said that for, from, again, from the time that they went back to Jerusalem to rebuild and to, to then on, there's going to be 490 years. Okay? That happened in 458 BC. So obviously the 490 years are done already, right? Because that happened thousands of years ago, but not to them. There's a hidden gap of time that we haven't read anything about yet that the Bible doesn't mention anywhere. So why do, you're probably asking, well, why do they do that then? Why do they put that gap in there? Because they have to in order to make their doctrine work. You have to insert things into the Bible if you want it to say what you want it to say. And you have to bend your, theolo your theology and your hermeneutics to make it say what you want it to say, even though it's not there at all. That's what people do, right? How many of you have ever encountered somebody that twists what scriptures say in order to make it say what they want it to say? But if you just read it for what it says, I would say 490 years. Okay, well, that happened thousands of years ago, so that already happened, right? That's just common sense. But if you want there to be an antichrist and a seven-year tribulation and a rapture and all that's in the future, well, you have to insert a gap of time there, which is what they do. And they will tell you, the Bible doesn't say a gap of time. But there has to be a gap of time because there's going to be a rapture in the future. Well, if there is no gap of time, then all their doctrine just falls to the ground. Absolutely. That's why the gap of time is so important for them. But if we can, this is why this is important for you guys to know. Because if you can prove this, then there ain't no such thing as a seven-year great tribulation. Sorry to say that. There ain't no such thing as a secret rapture of the church in the future where God goes back to dealing with the Jews. But everybody in town believes that. <clears throat> but anyways, so the last verse. Okay, are y'all following me so far? Uh, 927. I shouldn't have said that. It says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. I want y'all to remember that part. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Who's the he here? Mary said it. You sound like you didn't want to say it because you weren't sure. <laughs> yeah, it's Jesus, yes. The he there is the exact person that has been talking about this whole time, the prince, right? Yeah. The prince who is to come. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. How much is one week? Seven years. So Jesus, during that last seven, seven years of Daniel's prophecy, that's when Jesus' ministry started, right? It started, we already learned that. And then he was, what was he going to do while he was here? When Jesus was walking the earth, he was going to confirm a covenant with many. He was going to tell people, a new covenant is coming. And I'm confirming this with you. You better believe this because the gospel is here. What did he say? The king, repent for the kingdom of God is here. And so what was he doing? He was confirming the covenant. What's the covenant there? The new covenant. The covenant that's been prophesied about in the Old Testament. All this time. Remember Jeremiah, I think Ezekiel said, God is going to remember their sins no more. He's going to forgive everybody's sin. No more animal sacrifices. And everybody looked at Jeremiah and said, where is that it? It ain't here yet. It's coming after 483 years. When Jesus shows up, he was going to start confirming that covenant. But look what it says. But in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. What does that mean? In the middle of that week, 
Jesus was, remember, let's think back, he was cut off, remember? In the middle of that week, in the middle of that seven years, Jesus was killed, which is why Jesus' ministry was how long? Three and a half years. What's half of seven? Three and a half years. That's the last seven years. So actually, I believe that Jesus' ministry was supposed to be seven years. But he was killed in the middle of it. He was cut off. And when Jesus died, what happened? He brought an end to sacrifice and offering because he sacrificed himself on the cross. That was the one sacrifice that was needed to put an end to all the animal sacrifices because the blood, as Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats cannot save you anymore because the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice was more powerful than that. So when he was killed in the middle of that week, he brought an end to sacrifice and offering. Again, a futurist, they're still reading this and they're seeing the Antichrist all over it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'm getting there. <laughs> that's a that's a I'm glad that, I'm glad that you asked that question though. I'm glad that you asked that question because a lot of people wouldn't ask that. What about the last three and a half years? Okay. That's right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you. Hold, hold on. So he said he brought an end to the sacrifice and offering, and then it says, on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. What does that sound like? Abomination of desolation, which is what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, right? He says the abomination of desolation is going to happen. You see how all this fits together? When Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24, he's talking about Daniel 9, the prophecy. He says it just sounds a little weird right here because actually a lot of, uh, a lot of scholars had trouble interpreting this last verse right here because it sounds so weird in Hebrew. And if you read a bunch of different translations, they all sound different. But the New King James says, On the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So basically all he's saying, if you, if you read it from different translations and really study it, what he's saying is that the abomination of desolation is going to come and it's going to be poured out on the desolate. The abomination of desolation, I believe, was the Roman army that came and destroyed the temple. And who was the desolate? The Jewish people. Because it was the city. It was the temple. Because Jesus told them in Matthew. I'm getting all over the place. Matthew 23, he says, your house is left to you desolate. He told the Jews that. And then one chapter later, that's when he starts talking about Matthew, uh, Daniel 9. So the desolate, desolate just means like abandoned. It means like empty. No, there's nothing left. You have nothing more. The Jewish people were the desolate people because the, the kingdom was taken from them and given to the church, which is Jew and Gentile in one body. Okay? So that's what that scripture means. The abomination of desolation is going to come and it's going to destroy, uh, it's going to be poured out on the desolate, which is the Jewish people. And they believe, again, futurist people believe that the Antichrist is going to, when, oh, you know what, let me, let me show you this real quick, real quick. I'll, I'll, get, I'll come back to that thought. Uh, can you back up one time, Pastor Larry? I really want to get this before we're done. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, okay? Go to, leave your hand there and go to Matthew 26, verse 28. It says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And we know that that's Jesus, right? We just learned about that. Jesus was coming to make a covenant with many for one week. He was going to confirm it. Well, how do we know that that's Jesus? I can, we, we already know that, but let me prove it to you further. In Matthew 26, verse 28, very famous scripture. Go ahead, Pastor Larry. What did Jesus say when he gave the Eucharist, the communion? For this is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is shed for many. There's that word again. For the remission of sins. Notice how those two scriptures sound almost the same. He says that he's going to confirm a covenant with many, right? Who's that? We think that's Jesus. Okay, well, how can we know that for sure? Matthew 26, when Jesus at the Last Supper, when he raised up his glass, which is what we do the first every month, we're going to do that Sunday. He says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. You see how it sounds almost exactly like the prophecy of Daniel? For the remission of sins. So, in other words, Jesus was the one who came to confirm a covenant with many for one week. Many means everybody. Everybody. He came and he confirmed the covenant for the entire world. And he shed his blood. This is the covenant that we're talking about. The new covenant that Jesus came and died to give us. Okay. So, do y'all understand that? Okay. So, uh, Okay, just go back to the last part, Pastor Larry, there. Just the very last scripture I think I have on there. Very last slide. Okay, so we know that the abomination of desolation was the Romans that came and destroyed the city. But Elvira had the question about how Jesus was cut off and killed in the three and a half years. What about the last three and a half years? Now, there's no scripture that specifically says this is what happened in the last three and a half years. But if you read the Bible and you read the book of Acts, this is what, it, what happened. The last three and a half years, that's when the gospel was being preached to the Jewish people. Peter was standing up on the day of Pentecost, and he was only preaching to the Jewish people. And how, if you read the book of Acts, which happened just after Jesus died, you'll know that the gospel and Jesus was not being preached to the Gentiles right away. At the beginning of the, when, after Jesus died, only the Jewish people were being saved. And then what happened with Cornelius and what happened with the rest? The Gent- uh, Jewish people, I think Pastor Larry taught about it a couple few weeks ago. They said, we're astonished that the Holy Spirit is even being poured out on the Gentiles. And so they all had a council together and they said the gospel should be preached to the Gentiles as well. So in other words, what, what I believe and what many other people believe is that that last three and a half years was for the preaching to the Jewish people. Why? Because remember what Pastor Larry said. That prophecy was for who? The Jewish people. He says 490 years are given to your people, which are the Jewish people. So that last three and a half years was reserved for the preaching of the Jews. And then right there at the end of that three and a half years, that's when the gospel went out to the entire world, to the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think there's even a scripture. I uh, I don't I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it says that it's the, it's for the Jew first, and then for the Gentile second. So that last three and a half years. Well, all that was happening there was the gospel was being preached among the Jews. At the end of that, it went to the Gentiles, and it went to the entire world. Hallelujah. Amen. So, in other words, the 70th week of Daniel is already passed. It's, it's in the past. It's not a future seven-year great tribulation, which is very different from saying that it's the seven years was Jesus' ministry. <laughs> so, what do you believe? Do you believe the seven years was Jesus' ministry in the past? that came right after the 483 years? Or do you believe that it's God stopped the clock and threw those seven years in the future, and that's going to be when all hell breaks loose on the earth? (laughs) I don't know what y'all believe, but I'm very confident in what I believe about that. So are there any questions? Does anybody? All right. Y'all understand? Okay. All right. Y'all can read about that in the book, too. Maybe you're a better learner if you read it. It's in chapter 28. Amen. (laughs) Chapter 28. Amen. Let's all stand. I'll get y'all out of here. Well, I was in intercession for the Astros, but it didn't work. (laughs) I think there were probably more people in intercession that were Braves fans, probably. I don't know. (laughs) I'm just kidding, y'all. I'm just kidding. But uh, amen. Let's continue to pray for those needs. Uh, Vira, I know you're leaving tomorrow, so we're going to pray for safe travels for you. Amen. On the road. She's going to Arkansas. Amen. And uh, 
We'll continue praying for Joe. Amen. Am I forgetting anybody else? No, Diane's grandson, right? We'll continue to pray for that. For Lana. Lana and Sid. Okay. All right. Yeah, Annie. For Richard. That's right. Yes, for Richard. I knew I was forgetting something. Salema's dad. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's still a lot of health needs that we have in here. Amen. Let's bring these before the Lord. Let's bring them right now. We'll pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your word that was preached tonight. And Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in this church and in the lives of all the people that are here. Father, continue to move and continue to speak to their life and draw them closer to you, Father. Let them feel you stronger, Lord. And Father, as we leave this place, we just want to lift up the needs. You know, we want to lift up Joe, Father, to you. We want to lift up Sulema's dad, Father, Richard, you know, all these health needs, Diane's grandson, Father. And for uh, Lana, Lord, we want to lift her up, Mary's sister and her brother-in-law. We want to lift them up to you, Lord, because there are some serious needs here, Father. And we want to just continue to bring those to you, Father, because we know sometimes that consistency in our prayer is the key, Father. So we want to continue to bring these before you, Father, because we know that you've already moved and you've already healed. You've already done the work. But, Father, we just want to see it manifest even stronger now. In the name of Jesus, we speak it and we believe it and we stand in agreement. And we also pray for Elvira. Please protect her, Father, on her her drive there tomorrow, Lord. Let her be safe. Protect the car. Let her just have an easy trip up there, Father, and an easy trip back. Father, protect her, Lord. And as we leave this place, we know you're going to go with us, Father, and we're going to feel you the rest of the week. We just want to see your face more, Jesus. And we say all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Amen. All right. I love y'all. Y'all are dismissed.